If you would have asked me five years ago what the on-trend brewing thing would be in 2021, I never would have guessed that hard seltzer water would be so popular. Laugh all you want, but hard seltzer is a fantastic day drinker and likely isn't going anywhere in the near future. Imperial Yeast's new seasonal strain, W04 Paramount, can help brewers get the most out of their seltzer fermentations. A clean and aggressive fermenter, Paramount will produce an excellent seltzer with low fusel alcohols and it's produced in a gluten-free medium. If you've tried making seltzer with standard ale or lager strains, you know the struggle, and Imperial Yeast is here to help with W04 for Paramount. Check it out at imperialyeast.com. Welcome to the Brew Lab. The mashing process is one of the most important parts of brewing, and there are many different ways to conduct the mash with varying temperatures, rests at each temperature, and of course, changing the mixture or the malt bill of the underlying grains themselves. And from a fundamental level, you add water at a certain temperature, let it sit, rack off the sweet liquid, and the mash is done. But there is so much more going on during the mash. You might have heard of the amylases that turn starch into fermentable sugar, but have you heard of beta-glucanase? Do you know what it does? I'm your host, Kay Job, and today in the lab, I've got Sophie Held, who's formerly a student uh, at the University of California at Davis in Dr. Glenn Fox's lab, and she's here to talk to us about work that she did looking at beta-glucans, beta-glucanase, and different mash regimes, and how those different mash regimes and malt bills might impact beta-glucan concentration and beta-glucanase activity. So first off, we've got to start by talking about what the heck are uh, beta-glucans, uh, and then, of course, we'll talk about about the enzyme that breaks down beta-glucans, which is known as beta-glucanase, and why brewers might care about either or both of those things. You ever heard of the stuck sparge? Ever had one? <laughs> if you know, you know. Um, and beta-glucans might have played a role with those stuck sparges. So Sophie wanted to understand how different mash regimes and malt bills might impact beta-glucan concentration, wort viscosity, and beta-glucanase enzyme activity. So she developed a method to look simultaneously at both beta-glucan concentration and beta-glucanase activity, which is a pretty cool aspect of the study. So she looked at the European Brewing Congress's so-called Congress mash, which is also you know commonly known as a step mash, versus the Institute of Brewing's single infusion mash, uh, which is more consistent with what most brewers are doing today, and also looked at caramel malt and simulated what it would be like to, look, to use under-modified malts, all in hopes of understanding more about beta-glucans and and beta-glucanase during the mash. So there's a lot that you should know and apply in your brewery, and I'm excited to talk to Sophie about it. But first, if you haven't yet clicked the button to become a patron, please consider doing so. In addition to the feel-good vibes of helping to support the work we do here at Brewlosophy, you get access to a bunch of awesome rewards depending on the different pledge levels that you choose. You can get access to Brewlosophy contributor recipes that we've never before published, new discounts each month to yakimavalleyhops.com, who, by the way, originally developed a form of liquid hop extracts, the hop shots, which we just talked about on the last episode. Uh, and for $3, access to a monthly live Q&A session with a special guest from the brewing industry. This month's guest is the head mead maker of Moonlight Meadery, Michael Fairbrother. Now, I haven't personally had the pleasure of trying a Moonlight Mead, but they are constantly rated highly on the best in the business lists. And Michael has been making mead for a long time, and he knows a thing or two about making it good. How do I get rid of that sulfury smell in my mead? What's the difference between between Fermaid O and Fermaid K? What do you do? Uh, when do you add nutrients? Do you pasteurize your honey? These are all great questions to ask of Michael. And so I hope you'll take advantage of this great reward by becoming a patron of Brewlosophy at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thank you to everyone that's left a rating or review of the show. We're almost to 100 ratings on Apple Podcasts. I love reading your reviews. They're important for other listeners like you to find the show, and they also help us make sure we're bringing you the content that you want to listen to. So thank you to those that have rated or reviewed the show. And if you haven't yet, please do so. Feedback is brought to you by the imaginative crew at Haas, who developed a revolutionary way to dry hop using Spectrum, a flowable 100% hop-derived product that's fully dispersible in cold side applications for great flavor, efficiency, and less beer loss. No solids means less loss, and it's fully dispersible in cold beer, so there's no contact or residency time required like traditional dry hopping. Spectrum fully disperses immediately, so you don't need to wait 24 to 48 hours or worry about double dry hopping, and you don't have to have any special dry hopping equipment. 
It stores easily, it's easy to use, saving you precious time and getting instant aroma in each batch. It's currently available to commercial brewers in trial quantities of Citra and Mosaic, so check it out by visiting johnihaas.com. That's John, the letter I, H-A-A-S dot com. All right, listener Charles wrote in with a question about hop creep and brewing low or no alcohol beer. So he says, hey, Cade, I'm a big fan of the Brew Lab and was particularly inspired by Dr. Tondini's episode on brewing low alcohol beers, so decided to give one a go using the high temperature mash method. I designed a hazy and hoppy recipe using Dr. Tondini's recommendations for OG, mash temperature, and IBU, and I also added a little maltodextrin to increase the body. As I was trying to replicate a New England style, my only hop additions were in the Whirlpool ADC as well as a small dry hop addition during active fermentation 21C. This is where I feel that I screwed up. As we've also heard on the, fer- on the show, adding dry hops to fermented beer can restart fermentation, as enzymes present in the hops can convert the dextrins to fermentable sugars. In other words, hop creep. <laughs> All of my previous non-fermentables seem to get consumed and turned into CO2 and ethanol. The finished beer turned out to be 1.5% rather than 0.5%. Um, I had not acceptable to my non boozing buddies. There is of course a good chance my mash temperature was not as high as my brew system displayed, but I think for next time I will either add no dry hops or, or ensure to add the hops post fermentation and at a lower temperature, though this would mean that there's a risk of refermentation if the beer warms up to post packaging. Anyway, I thought this might be something you'd like to discuss or just bring up or discuss on the show, even if only to warn others not to fall into this trap. Just let me know if you'd like any more detail on the brew. Keep up the good work. Hey, Charles, thanks for sending in the question, the feedback. This is really good to know. And there certainly could be hop creep from dry hopping low or non-alcoholic beers. Um, I recently brewed a beer, uh, an experiment or a batch using the method that you just talked about, right? Which was I, I did a dry hopped lager um, using a high mash temperature versus a, a cold steep. Um, but I only used about 15 grams in a 20 liter or 5.5 gallon batch. And so I didn't see very much hop creep, at least as far as I know. I drank those beers pretty fast fast and really only measured the ABV um, at the end of fermentation, or rather the OG um, at the end of fermentation. So it's possible that it crept while it was in the keg, but I did also store it cool. Um, but very interesting to see that yours crept so much, right? Um, that's very possible to go from 0.5 to 1.5%. And something to think about, if you're brewing non-alcoholic beers, be careful um, of hop creep. Make sure that your beer is actually um, fermenting to full attenuation, uh, that you're storing those beers cold, uh, and that when you add those dry hops, that you're not increasing the alcohol concentration. So yeah, thanks again for sending in this feedback. I'll be back in a few minutes with Sophie Held talking about beta-glucans and beta-glucanase with different mash regimes and malt bills. We all know that designing recipes is really fun, and doing it well is so much easier with good software. We at Brewlosophy recently made the switch to Brewfather, and honestly, y'all, we could not be happier. Brewfather utilizes the latest technology to bring you the most robust cloud-based recipe design software that can be accessed anywhere, on your phone, tablet, desktop, and even offline. It also works seamlessly with numerous third-party devices to make it easier to monitor every step of your brew. I know change can be difficult, but trust me when I say you need to go to brewfather.app today to try it out for yourself. That's brewfather.app. Established in 1995, More Beer has been consistently serving the greater brewing community since the times IPA was expected to be bitter and clear. And there are reasons they've stuck around so long. In addition to their massive product selection and excellent customer service, More Beer has locations on both the West and the East Coast of the United States, which translates into fast shipping times regardless of where you live. And when you spend more than $59, shipping is free. When you're in need of brewing ingredients and gear, there's no better option than morebeer.com, one of the most trusted shops on the planet. Early contests build momentum for 2024 contenders seeking the White House. C-SPAN offers unfiltered coverage of events leading into early primaries and caucuses. Get access to speeches and results with a free app. C-SPAN now or watch live on the C-SPAN networks. Mm 
Mashing is the name for the process where the starch endosperm of the barley kernel is converted into fermentable sugars. It's an enzymatic process where enzymes like alpha and beta amylase work on long-chain starch molecules and break them into fermentable chunks. There's another enzyme active in the mash called beta-glucanase, which I honestly don't know much about. So today in the lab, I've got Sophie Held, master student at UC Davis, who's here to help. Sophie, welcome to the Brew Lab. Hi, Cade. Thanks so much for having me. Ah, I'm glad to have you back or glad to have you here. Um, I've had Dr. Fox on the show before and a couple of your other peers, James Bruner. Um, I don't know if you knew him, uh, yes. but I've had him on the show as well. Uh, and the only thing I know about beta glucans is that allegedly they're sticky. Um, and, uh, I don't know, is that all there is to know? Are we done? I mean, I hope not. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the best way to start conceptualizing beta glucans, um, is they're famously in those heart healthy cereals. Um, ah. they're a big, long fiber molecule, um, that nutritionists love for reducing cholesterol, um, and what uh, gives those cereals their heart healthy benefit. Um, so as much as they're positively sticky in our digestive system, um, in the brewing process, that stickiness can be more of a problem. Ah, I like it. I love that analogy, right? We want the the healthy things to stick in our body so that we can process them. <laughs> um, but, but, but we don't want them to stick in our uh, in our mash tons. Very cool. Well, all right, let's talk a little bit about you then. So again, you're a master student in Dr. Glenn Fox's lab there at the University of California at Davis, um, and you have a BS in food science from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. What made you want to study brewing science? Yeah, so uh, as an undergrad at University of Minnesota, I uh, started working in a cereal chemistry lab, and I got to look at really big molecules in cereal grains and how they affect the way that we use those grains. Um, so I was initially focused on proteins that make gluten, um, and studying brewing science was a cool way to transition into studying other molecules in a new format, making beer instead of bread. Um, I think also uh, brewing science was a really interesting way to use science to observe the beer making process, which is a, a process that's powered by nature and powered by the way that barley and hops exist, um, but then controlled uh, in a really beautiful way through technicians and brewers. Ah, I love that too. That's another great way to say it, right? We always talk about bre uh, uh, brewing being art and science. And it is. It's beautiful. That's why I love that. I mean, I have a whole podcast um, about how we use science uh, you know, to observe what's going on um, during the whole brewing process. And I love episodes like this where we get to sort of dig into the details of, of you know, something that may be lesser known for most brewers. I mean, I'm not going to say... I think most brewers may have heard the term beta glue. I mean, I know I certainly have, but that's kind of where my knowledge ends. Um, and I think a lot of brewers, that's kind of where their knowledge ends, too. Um, and it's, so it's pretty cool that we're going to be able to talk about, you know, beta-glucans, uh, beta-glucanase, uh, which is an enzyme that acts on beta-glucans. Um, and so uh, the way that we're going to do that is through a study. And, and your study, you wanted to understand how uh, beta-glucanase activity changes using different malt or mash profiles, malt bills, and levels of malt modification and in turn, how beta-glucanase activity impacts the amount of beta-glucans. Um, is that a fair like overall goal of your study? Yeah, um, I think key in developing this experiment um, and the design of the study was knowing that brewers do a whole lot of different things when they brew beer. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, recipes that are just a simple two-row all the way through, but oftentimes brewers play with different dynamics, temperature, what grains they're using, um, and then depending on the grains that they're using, that would impact the level of modification. So understanding how all of those factors would influence the way that this enzyme and its substrate, beta-glucan, interact. Um, I think something key to understand with beta-glucanase is it's a lot more sensitive to temperature than other um, enzymes that are in the mash, the amylases um, that break down starch, right? So in a higher temperature mash, uh, these these enzymes are a lot more impacted than the starch degrading enzymes. Conversely, in a lower temperature mash, we see a lot more beta-glucanase activity. Um, and I wanted to understand and kind of compare 
how those temperature profiles as well as other factors um, influence the beta-glucan and beta-glucanase relationship. I see. You're tying this all together for me, right? You gained this. This has why you studied brewing science is so you could observe science um, and how brewer, uh, brewers can manipulate uh, these things. And now you're actually doing it um, in your research, uh, looking at beta glucans and beta gluconase. This is going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited about this. Um, and so well, why don't you take us through just a, a like a, a real brief overview, like abstract level of, of what you did in the study and then maybe a tease of a big takeaway? Yeah. Um, so Initially, I wanted to compare the the classic European Brewing Congress ABC mash, which is the the classic stepwise mash starting in at 45 Celsius, ramping up um, to 60 Celsius, uh, and then compare it with the Institute of Brewing guideline mash, um, which just starts right at the 60 Celsius level. And I think I may be getting those temperatures a little bit mixed up. Ah, that's um, okay. We'll work it out. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. That's okay. okay. But yeah, um, the, the the Congress <laughs> mash is the step mash, right? That's the one that goes through different different levels to for, to optimize different enzyme activity. But Institute of Brewing is more like what most brewers are doing, the single infusion mash, right? Yes. Um, and so it's interesting going through research for a long time. A lot of research was based on this EBC mash. And now we're finding completely different findings uh, from the past because brewers are are using this higher temperature mash um, and it affects how enzymes are active during the mashing process. Um, another key aspect of this study is I wanted to measure um, from the same sample the beta-glucanase enzyme activity and the beta-glucan concentration in the wort. Um, with a lot of classical methods, you can look at one but not the other or you can look at one and infer the other. Um, but I devised a method that could be run on an auto analyzer, um, the Beer Master Gallery from Thermo Scientific. Um, and this, this auto analyzer enabled me to be at the mash bath in one corner of the room, pulling samples and then putting them on the, the gallery auto analyzer so that it could run my analyses for me to measure both beta-glucan and beta-glucanase from the same samples. Wow, that's pretty cool. So any brewers out there that are looking to be able to run this, because that's a good point, right? You, can, you can't do beta, well, up to this point, and using traditional methods, you can't do beta-glucanase and beta-glucan. So you're just estimating whatever your beta-glucan content is based on your starting beta-glucan and whatever activity the beta-glucanase um, is having. That's really interesting. Well, I want to dive into that um, whenever we get into the methods uh, section a little bit later. Um, and then a big takeaway from your study. Um, yeah. So we saw what we, we, what we expected that, um, that with higher temperatures, you have less beta glucanase activity and therefore more beta glucan is able to accumulate in the wort. Um, and then this effect was more dramatic when we were running mashes at high temperatures that had a lot of beta glucan to start with. So starting with um, a malt blend that had a higher beta-glucan content or a blend of malt and barley, um, which, of course, would have a higher beta-glucan content as well. Yeah. And of course, that that single infusion mash, that Institute of Brewing mash is the one that's at the higher temperatures. So that's the one that's producing lots of beta-glucans because we're denaturing the beta-glucanase enzyme. Correct. Yes. All right. Cool. Okay. All right. That's a good overview. We need to back it up a little bit because I think we need to talk about, um, you know, the mash process itself and then beta glucans, where they come from and all that stuff. So let's go through that and let's, I guess, start with the mash. I'll ask this question. I think most people listening to the podcast are probably going to understand this, but I think you have to start here, right? What's going on during the mashing process? Yeah, so during the mashing process, you're taking malt, barley malt, typically, um, and using the enzymes present in the malt to uh, transform the sugars from uh, transform starches into sugars that are fermentable by the yeast. Um, and so this is, again, this this beautiful process of brewing. We're taking an enzyme that's naturally present from the germination of a seed um, and using it to to make fermentable sugar to make beer, um, just just fascinating. <laughs> yeah. um, the uh, so the the 
starch degrading enzymes are working on starches, but you also have proteinases that are working on protein. And of course, in the in this paper, we're focusing on the beta glucanases that break down beta glucan as well. Yeah. So where do the beta glucanases come in and, and, and beta glucans? Are they also in that that enzyme package from the germinated barley? Yeah, so when uh, maltsters germinate barley, um, they get the seeds wet um, to kind of stimulate that springtime sprouting process, um, and it generates enzymes through the outer layers of of the barley barley shell, the barley kernel. Yeah, yeah. Um, and those enzymes migrate inwards. They first have to break down the um, fibrous cell wall layers that package the starch and protein inside them. Um, so beta glucans exist mainly in these, these um, cell walls in the barley kernel. Um, and so it's like unwrapping a present, like you first have to tear off the paper and then you can open the box and then you can look at what's inside the starches, the proteins. Um, so a lot of the beta glucan and beta glucanase hydrolysis um, process happens during malting. But there's still, you know, the leftover little bits of wrapping paper and box um, by the time that the malt is used in the mashing process. Right. And still a bunch of presents that haven't been unwrapped yet, I'm guessing, too, right? Like still a lot yeah, of those that yeah. are just in the bag that haven't been unwrapped. Yeah. Oh, OK. I love that analogy. Right. I, I love that. So that's where beta glucans. So it's kind of like, it, it, yeah, like you said, it's like you've got a whole bag full of presents and you want what's in the presents. So you've got to rip all the wrapping paper out. You got to take them out, rip all the wrapping paper, you know, open them up um, and then get to the present, get to uh, the present itself. So then it, it, beta glucanases are are are. Um, I mean, I guess they're, they're present, right? They're, they're endogenous to the 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 malt. Um, and so there's most of you said most of the beta glucanase is going to happen during the malting uh, process. Is there also beta glucanase that's going on during the mash? I'm guessing the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, yes. So beta glucanase is able to survive the kilning process um, in a large enough fraction to be present at the time of mash in. Um, from there, the temperature of the mash dictates how quickly that enzyme will denature. Um, so when enzymes heat up, they're unable to hold their active form. They're unable to do their work um, and become denatured, become inactive. Um, so throughout that that mashing process, enzymes are, are fighting to stay in their active form. Um, and that impacts how much of the remaining wrapping paper the remaining beta glucan is able to be um, digested or uh, clipped up by this enzyme. Okay, so then if I, it, it makes sense to me, like looking at like the starches, right? I understand we want to break, we want amylases to break apart the starches and turn those into fermentable sugars that the yeast can consume. But why do we care about the little bits of papers? Why do why do you know brewers care about beta glucans? Yeah, so um, beta glucans, they. Um, by nature, they can ab absorb a lot of water. Um, and this is what we were referring to earlier as them being sticky. Um, and this can show up in a lauder process or a mash filtration process where the beta glucan holds on to, to the liquor, holds on to the wort, um, and it slows your runoff, slows your filtration. Um, some people have reported that excess beta glucan that makes it through to the wort. Um, so some some beta glucan can be soluble in um, soluble in the wort, uh, but when the temperatures cool down, it'll fall out of solution um, and become an unwanted haze, not the really stable ah. protein haze that people are after in their New England IPAs. Um, it can also form weird gels at the bottom of fermenters <laughs> or barrels um, as it's falling out of solution. Um, yeah, I, that makes sense, right? I, I I love this paper analogy too because I'm thinking like, oh yeah, there's if there's little bits of paper in my beer, it's going to be hazy, right? And and yeah, then, and no like, one wants that <laughs> sticky and gross, and I just don't want that uh, that in my beer. Um, but that that the the point that you mentioned about it it like being sticky, right? That that uh, it collects water well, or it sticks to the wort um, um, or the liquor, and slows runoff and slows filtration. That's the thing that I've heard the most um, about beta 
glue cans. I always hear uh, brewers talking about like stuck sparges and things like that, right? Yeah, and there's a lot of factors that can cause a stuck sparge. Um, you know, just how tightly packed your grain bed is from your your grist particle size. Um, if there's any undigested starches, that has a very large impact on a, on a stuck sparge. But of course, beta glucan can be a factor as well. Yeah, and I guess that that touches a little bit on my next question. I was going to ask how do brewers mitigate these problems, right? I mean, if ba- malted barley has um, you know, all endosperm have these beta glucans that they've got to unwrap to get to the starches and sugars. That sounds like a problem that we're always going to have in beer. So how do brewers mitigate that problem? Yeah, so most brewers um, rely on having good quality malt from maltsters and maltsters rely on having good quality barley from um, barley growers. Uh, so the the amount of beta glucan in barley is one of the the factors that determines is it feed grade or malting grade. Um, and then it goes on to the malt process where the level of beta glucan is further broken down. Um, and then finally in the brew house, if folks are using a blend of grains that would increase the beta glucan content, um, the uh, the brewers would likely add some exogenous enzymes. So that's enzyme that's coming from outside of the barley kernel. Um, and there's a lot of commercial enzyme blends that would help to break down beta glucan as well. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because I always think about the malting process as like priming the grain, right? It's sort of like getting it ready uh, for the brewer. And so it sounds like that's a little bit of what's happening. Like during the malting process, they're priming by uh, allowing beta glucanase to do its job and break up these beta glucans. Um, and and I guess that's another interesting question is is this idea of modification, right? This mo- The modification of the malt. That's one of those things I always think about when I think of like priming uh the 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 barley kernel uh to be ready to brew uh during the malt malt process so what is there a relationship between like modification and beta glucans or or beta glucanase yeah so usually when folks talk about modification um they'll use colback index as a, a way to to kind of describe that and so that's the ratio of uh soluble protein to uh full protein in the kernel. Um, So in the malting process, again, that package analogy, like if we think of beta glucan as the wrapping paper, maybe the protein is the box underneath. Um, So of course, as as the one is getting ripped up, the other is also starting to be worked on. Um, So we can we can see a parallel between Colback index and um, beta glucan degradation or uh, digestion. but usually when people talk about modification, they're focused on that that protein box surrounding the starch present. I see. And so then I guess if a malt is well modified or like or or under modified, then I guess what would be how would the beta gluconase activity change in those situations? Yeah. So um, generally during the malting process, uh, the the beta gluconase is generated by around day three um, of malting. And so there's still the same amount of beta gluconase but perhaps it hasn't had as as much time to work or it's working on a larger quantity of of beta glucan um so surviving the kilning process you still have a lot of undigested beta glucans but you still have residual enzyme activity so in theory in a low enough temperature mash like the abc protocol you could have the enzyme activity work on the remaining beta glucan to kind of clean up that work that wasn't accomplished in an under modified malt. I see. So an under modified malt might not have had as much opportunity for beta gluconase to work. So there may be a higher concentration of starting beta glucan in an under modified malt versus an over modified malt or maybe not over but a well modified malt which would have a lot of opportunity for the beta glucanase to work and maybe a lower starting concentration of beta glucans. Correct. Yes. I see. Okay. Interesting. So this, so, all right, I'm starting to understand then like the reason why you structured uh, your study the way you did, because you've got, you're looking at the mash regime itself, um, right? Which, which um, I, well, we need to spend some time talking about that, right? <laughs> um, how might the different uh, mash regimes, I mean, we mentioned the Congress mash versus the single infusion mash. How might those mash regimes impact uh, beta glucan or beta gluconase levels? 
Yes. Um, so in a malt or a grist bill that has some level of beta-glucan present, um, we would hope that the residual beta-glucanase activity in the malt could help clean up some of that, mop it up so it doesn't end up in our wort. Um, so in the Congress match, we start at 45 Celsius, um, and I have the numbers up in front of me. Perfect. Now, yeah. So I, can be sure. <laughs> I knew we'd uh, get there. Yeah. <laughs> um, it start at 45 degrees Celsius. So this is still a little higher than what the beta glucanase enzyme would like. It kind of likes to ride at maybe more 38 Celsius, but um, nonetheless, it's still able to have enough activity that through the initial um, stage of the mashing process, um, 30 minutes at 45 Celsius, there's enough enzyme activity to mop up the remaining beta-glucan. Um, then, of course, as the mash ramps up um, to the next phase, at 70 Celsius, we see that enzyme activity decrease Um and if there's any um, any still residual beta glucan in in the in the grist, we would see that start to climb at that point too, because there's no beta glucanase to digest it. Conversely, looking at an IOB mash um, that starts at 65 Celsius, the glucanase prefers 38 Celsius. This is you know too much hot water. Yeah, it's almost um, double, right? It's, just, it simply yeah. cannot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just can't do it. Um, and we see enzyme activity rapidly decrease um, and in turn beta-glucan accumulation in the wort and the liquid fraction rapidly increase. Um, and that's only exacerbated if we start out with a lot of beta-glucan in the malt bill. Yeah, so tying those two things together, right? If we're starting with under modified malt that has a lot of beta glucan, um, and and you know maybe potentially a lot of potential beta glucanase, if you're throwing that into the IOB or like the single infusion mash, like most brewers, which are pitching at 65 and that's somewhere around 150 uh, Fahrenheit, um, you know you're pitching straight into there. You're just denaturing all those enzymes, so all that beta glucanase from those under modified malts is going to going to transfer into your wort. Yeah, the, the beta glucanase is, you could say, negligible in yeah. those types of conditions. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting, too, because you mentioned this in your paper, and this is kind of a key point, right? The EBC method is how maltsters are measuring it, and it's how it, that's it's how they're measuring this malt quality component, right? They're using the EBC um, Congress mash to do this, but then brewers are doing something totally different with it. Yeah, there's, there's a bit of a disconnect, um, and... It, the EBC number will give you a ballpark, um, but it's not going to be predictive of what your final board beta glucan will look like as a brewer. Right. And and I guess I should also mention here too, right? There's a really good reason why maltsters are doing that, uh, the EBC number. For, it's because for a very, very long time, most brewers were brewing that way, doing a protein rest, a stepwise mash, you know, all the way up. I mean, German brewers and, and big macro brewers have been doing that for a really long time. Um, so it's not unreasonable to for the maltsters to use this as their quality metric. Uh, but it's interesting interesting that studies like this, and I think um, Dr. Fox has done a couple of other studies too, which have sort of raised questions about whether this EBC mash is useful for predicting these things like beta glucanase. And, you know, this study as well, um, you know, makes some, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I guess may, may weigh into that a little bit. How well does the EBC mash predict uh, beta glucan and beta glucanase activity um, versus uh, the IOB when more brewers are doing the IOB? IOB method, the single infusion mash. Um, so why don't you take us through, like walk us through, introduce the study a little bit, um, you know, m like mainly in terms of like what parameters you decided to look at and how you uh, studied those. And then we'll take a break and get back into like methods and, and also the results. Yeah. Um, so designing this study, I looked at three different parameters. So the first is that mash regime. So the temperature profile that I was going to mash these these uh, grains under. I chose a modified IOB method from an Evans paper, and then a uh, an EVC method um, to compare the stepwise mash versus the single infusion mash. The next parameter was the level of malt modification. Um, so I couldn't access uh, easily a an under modified malt. Sure. Um, yeah. So what I did to approximate this was combining um, a fully modified two roll or pilsner malt with ten percent or twenty percent barley. Um, so that would 
increase the the beta glucan content because it hasn't had a chance to start like again the analogy of unwrapping that present um I think to note there, it would also have a lot of starch and protein molecules uh, that haven't been undegraded too, uh, which is one limitation um, to using this method. But um, the third parameter uh, was modifying, or not modifying, a uh, better word would be to, to change the malt bill. So including um, caramel malt, um, and as well as comparing the Pilsner base malt with the two row malt um, and having this unmalted barley condition. Yeah, because um, that's something that was interesting. I, I learned from your study is like looking at the people who have done the research on beta glucans are generally just looking at, you know, um, a, a, a Pilsner malt beer. Right. And they're doing all of their research or whatever modifications that they're making in their research. It's basically just that same, you know, Pilsner malt uh, beer. But you identified that, hey, there may be some differences between Pilsner malt and two row malt. And then what if we throw in, uh, you know, some specialty malts like caramel malt um, and under modified malt, you know, uh, the, so that we can better understand you know, what really is happening to beta glucanase uh, in the malt. Right. Yeah, correct. I think again the one of the concepts behind the study was brewers do so many different things um that's one of the wonderful things about the craft beer movement is that uh really any combination under the sun someone's tried it uh <laughs> to some degree of success uh <laughs> right <laughs> and um so to understand that perspective a little bit better in a in a science method and in a publication um, I think was something important to me when I was when I was developing this study. And yeah, I, I can't I can't do all of all of the conditions, but I was hoping to hit some of the big targets. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, if you're if you're trying to, you know, manipulate conditions, right, you're trying to make uh, you, you've, you've got some sort of sticky wort, you're trying to change your malt, your mash regime or or changing up the malt bill. I mean, these are things that brewers would do uh, every day at the brewery. Uh, and then so in terms of like what you looked at, I guess, I mean, Obviously, you're looking at the beta glucan concentration and beta glucanase activity. Um, and again, you uh, came up with a novel idea uh, to measure those from the same sample, which we'll get into um, after the break. Um, but then, I mean, ultimately, it, actually, if you look at this, this is a lot of mashes because if I'm thinking about it, okay, you've got two conditions for the mash regime, you've got two or no, three combinations uh, for malt modification. You've got one that's just straight, you know, a Pilsner two row, and then you've got one that's slightly under under modified at 10 percent with uh you know uh raw barley in it and then another one that's at 20 percent. so you got three conditions there and then you're adding in the caramel malt so you've got like 10 different combinations of malt uh, that you're doing <laughs> under two different regimes that's a lot of mashes it was a lot of mashes yeah um i spent a lot of time in the lab <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure you did i'm sure you did and then of course measuring all that and measuring the beta glucanase activity and beta glucan levels well cool all right um so i want to hear uh how all of this worked i want to hear the differences between the mashes and under modified grains and also how the calmer malt played in um so let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and look at uh, methods and results. One of the biggest improvements to my brewing practices was the upgrade to stainless steel. And Delta Brewing Systems offer some of the lowest prices on high quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which holds 8 gallons or 30 liters of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow off, and it can hold up to 4 psi of pressure. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest priced all in one electric brew systems out there. And their prices are remarkably affordable. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear, that won't break the bank, you've got to check out deltabrewingsystems.com. If you've ever brewed with a high percentage of oats in your grain bill, you probably experienced the trouble of a slow runoff or worse, the dreaded stuck sparge. Um, this is likely at least partially due to a high beta glucan concentration in the wort. And Sophie, I want to ask you if in your trials uh, you had any difficulties with sparging. But first, you let me know during the break, I actually introduced you as a master student uh, at Dr. Fox's lab, but you have graduated. Um, so congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, you made it through and you've now graduated. 
Thanks. Yeah, no, it's it's nice to be on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so what are you doing now? Um, I'm currently working for a food importer. Um, so looking a lot more at, at cheese than beer. But uh, hey, we like both. Yeah, that, well, well, good. And I'm sorry about that, that I messed that up. But I'm glad we were able to fix that here. And so again, congratulations on your master's degree. Um, but I wanted to ask the question uh, about the the difficulties in sparging. Um, to, did you have, you, you know, you, this is a beta glucan study. So I'm, did you have any difficulties in like sparging your, your uh, trial words? Well, so luckily, I was just doing a, a benchtop based um, filtration assay um, and not a full sparge. Um, so I, you know, I could take as long a time as I needed. These warts did not have to turn out into anything that would taste good. But uh, that being said, it did take quite a long time and it, it kept me in uh, in the lab a little later some <laughs> nights than I would have liked. <laughs> I can totally imagine. I, having uh, seen a couple of those done here at Oregon State too, I can, t- I, I can tell you, yeah, letting that mash drip out and filter takes a long time <laughs> to, to, to do. Um, there's no pump, you know, pulling through or pulling anything through through the grain bed. You're just no, kind of letting gravity just work. Just gravity. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, cool. Okay, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time um, on uh, the methods because I think they're important here. Um, and we we mentioned a little bit about the EBC and IOB protocols, but I just want to go back into those real quick so that everybody can understand exactly what the MASH regime aspect of this study was looking at. So maybe take us through those couple of protocols and maybe how they're different. Yeah, so um, just summary up top, EBC, two stages, cold, then hot. IOB, one stage, just hot. Um, and, and cold is relative. Uh, 45 Celsius is still fairly warm. <laughs> yeah. um, so in an EVC protocol, uh, you're starting out with a, a finer grist, um, so a little bit finer grind, um, which gives you some advantages for, for enzyme activity. Um, you start at 45 Celsius, which gives you some exa- advantages for enzyme activity because um, the enzymes are less likely to denature or won't denature as fast. Um, as you ramp up until 70 Celsius, that's when you get um, your your starch hydrolysis really in gear um, because the starch needs to, to solubilize, um, to gelatinize a little bit. Um, in order to really be digested and available to those enzymes. Um, and then you finished it out uh, at, at 70 Celsius um, and you filter it off. Yeah, doing like a traditional mash, mash rest. So like this is like the traditional brewing rest, right? Or or what, most, what traditional brewers would have done historically. There we go. That's what I'm trying to say. Like a historical regime where you're just kind of sitting at a low temperature for a little bit for protein rest or something like that, you know, or beta glucanase in this case, and then raising it up. Um, so you're getting your starch hydrolysis and conversion uh, over into fermentable sugars and then sitting in a mash out at like 70 Celsius for uh, 10 minutes or so. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. And I, I also feel like, um, you know, as a home brewer too, there's so many times where I've missed my strike temperature yeah. and you end up, even if you had intentions to do a single infusion, doing a bit of a, a Congress stepwise anyway. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um. Exactly. Yeah. I've, I've missed it both ways um, on occasion. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. darn, that was not, that's too low. Shoot. But oh, well, yeah, that's too high. Oh, well, <laughs> I guess we're doing a protein rest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that rest is often known as the protein rest. Um, but also behind the scenes, there can be some beta-glucanase activity as well. Yeah. Um, we'll turn next to the IOB um, mash. I use this modified IOB uh, method from an uh, Evans paper. Uh, it just tweaked a couple of the parameters a little bit um, to, to make it more updated for uh, the, the current brewing industry practices. Um, this starts with a, a high or a larger grift size. Um, so you have larger particles of, of grain. Uh, you start in at 65 Celsius. Um, you you rest at 65 Celsius for a little bit before. Yeah, it's like 50 minutes at 65 Celsius, um, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah for, for, for 50 minutes, yes. Um, and then you do a final mash out temperature rise. Yeah, temperature rise to 74, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Yes, yeah. Yeah. 
Hey, so it's Got a, a it's a, turned around. That's okay. Yeah, and it's a little bit higher. So it's a little bit higher temperature um, mash out. But it but the biggest difference is where it starts, right? I mean, you know, the EBC math mash starts at forty five Celsius. Uh, that's around one hundred and thirteen Fahrenheit. Um, so it starts down pretty low, and it sits there for you know at least ten minutes. Um, you know, so you're getting a lot of things going on, and in, in this case, beta glucans. Um, whereas the IOB, you're sitting at sixty five for 50 minutes. So there's that's a hot temperature and denaturing a lot of those enzymes. I would say to me those are kind of the biggest differences between the methods. Although the grist size is important too and I don't want to forget that either. Um, because again, you know, the the IOB method is more approximating what most brewers are doing. The EBC is really getting to a, like a fine grist, like almost a, a flour um, when, whenever you're doing that mash, right? Yeah, yeah. The the fine grist and the EBC, because of that small particle size, um, it's a lot easier for enzymes to get in there sooner and start breaking things down. Whereas a larger particle size, the seven millimeter grap that is used um, in a, a coarse grist and more commonly in a lot of brewing practices, just because of the size, those pieces are a, lar- a little larger. It's harder for the enzymes to get all the way into the center of one of those pieces. Yeah. Um, you know, side by side, it isn't that much to the eye, but when you're looking at a microscopic level, yeah, that's that's a yeah. huge difference. Yeah, it, quite quite a big difference. Well, then let's start right there. Then at those um, those mash regimes, right? That was a comparison that you wanted to make in this study. Um, so let's start there. Um, maybe let's start with the uh, the EBC results uh, to see, or you know, either either or we can compare them as well uh, wherever you'd like to start. But let's start with that mash regime parameter and and figure out what results you had there. Or oh, wait, we oh, almost forgot. I almost forgot. We should talk about uh, the method that you used for measuring uh, the the beta glucan and beta gluconase, right? Because that's going to be important. So let's talk through that real quick. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for beta glucan, um, we used uh, a, a calcifloor method. So it's a fluorescent dye that happens to bond pretty selectively to um, beta glucan that's um, of a larger size. Uh, once once beta-glucans are digested a significant amount, um, the the dye will no longer bind. Um, so it's it's giving us a reflection of the larger in size beta-glucan molecules. Um, so that's the calcifloor for measuring the beta-glucan in solution. The beta-glucanase uh, is used using a special substrate it's a, a short little beta glucan molecule with a fluorescent dye particle attached to one end. So as the beta gluconase acts on that particle, um, it releases the dye and the dye shows a color that can be read by the spectrophotometer. Um, so both of these assays, uh, because they're a, a color of fluorescent um, reaction at the end, they can be measured using this auto, auto analyzer. Um, so the auto analyzer is doing all of the pipetting, um, all of the incubation timing, and then finally the the color absorbance reading at the end. Um, wow. So it's part of what made this uh, process possible is I could be standing at the mash bath <laughs> for all of those mashes of all the different con- conditions while the auto analyzer was running in the background pipetting my samples and measuring both beta glucan and beta gluconase. Gosh, yeah, it just it, it totally just clicked for me whenever you said the amount of work that this would have been if not for that auto analyzer, right? Because I'm just thinking about like with enzymes activity, you can't let those samples sit because the enzymes activity is going to change. So you have to measure it as soon as you pull it off of the mash. And if you're doing that for all of these different conditions and having to hand pipette and hand uh, you know, measure on the spectrophotometer, you know, uh, take all of your samples and all the glassware and all that stuff. Holy moly. That would have been, uh, that would have been a, a, yeah, maybe a, a, a doctoral um, <laughs> work because it would have taken years <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to do. Uh, I would, I probably would have had to ask an undergrad for help. Uh, yeah, think, yeah, absolutely. A lot of the pipetting. Yeah, maybe more than um, one undergrad. Uh, yeah. But that's cool. So that auto analyzer then essentially does it all for you. And, and, and so that's what it's reading. It's reading 
rating, um, an absorbance rating on the spectrophotometer, and that's essentially telling you here's what the uh, activity is and here's what the beta glucan concentration is at that moment whenever it makes the, the measurement. So you're not having to do them independently or separate from them. You're using one sample and measuring both of those metrics in the same sample. Yes, and I, I try to be as consistent with my timings. As you mentioned, with enzyme activity, there could be some drift. Um, so I try to be consistent. Um, however, I will acknowledge that, you know, there's always the potential for, for a little drift in activity or the, the beta glucan in, in solution. Sure, sure. Of course. Right. Uh, yeah. There's always a little bit of, uh, of that kind of thing in every, in every study. Okay. We nerded out on the, uh, assay there for a little bit. Um, <laughs> and I, I think, yeah, uh, hopefully yeah, I'm sure there were some people that just rolled their eyes, but I'm sure there were also a bunch of people that are listening to the show that just went like, Oh, that's super cool. I love that. Um, um, so cool. All right, let's get in the results then. So we were talking about the two mash regimes. Um, so each EBC um, and IOB. Uh, so why don't we start there with those results or maybe the EBC results? Yeah. So with the EBC mash, um, again, we saw what we were expecting. There was definitely beta glucanase activity um, during around the, the, the first 35 minutes of the mash. Um, so for the initial rest, as well as through the earlier stages of the temperature ramp, um, once the temperature ramped uh, to 70 degrees, there was no uh, beta glucanase activity left. Um, so this this makes sense because the beta glucanase thrives at around 38 degrees Celsius. Uh, so it can handle 45 degrees Celsius, but starts kind of wimping out at the higher temperatures. Yeah. Yeah, it um, makes total sense, right? And this is exactly what you expected to see. You, the 45 degrees for 30 minutes is where all the beta-glucanase activity is going to continue to happen. I think you mentioned it's like 38 degrees Celsius is where it's kind of ideal temperature is, but 45 still close enough um, that it can, it can do a lot. Uh, you know, and so, yeah, you see this, right? You see, um, even I guess, uh, you know, with that MASH regime, um, that... that I mean, I don't know. Actually, let me ask this question. Was that like regardless of the modification of the malts? Um, so like even, you know, even the under modified malt would still, uh, you know, do OK, at least in terms of, you know, uh, chopping up those beta glucans. Yeah, um, because of um, though this is another opportunity to nerd out, uh, but. Uh, taking folks back to their biochemistry, Michaelis Menten kinetics, the concentration of enzyme can be very, very small to still have an effect on the amount of substrate. Um, so the the amount of beta glucanase was essentially the same in all of these conditions. Um, it was the amount of beta glucan that changed that substrate concentration. Um, so we saw pretty much the same beta glucanase activity throughout all of the the EBC mashes um, with, you know, some some statistical variation that would be expected. Right, right. Interesting. OK, that's cool. So so then I, the EBC, so then the mash regime itself seems to play um, a big role, right? Or at least that that it's pretty consistent across all the conditions that you see beta glucanase activity in the EBC mash. Yeah, because of that, that activity, um, we see the the beta glucanase able to act on the beta glucan molecules. So throughout the the first um, thirty minutes of the mash, we see that beta glucan is approximately constant. Um, and I interpret this as at about the same rate that beta glucan is able to um, enter solution. Uh, so to go from like a rigid solid carbohydrate to one that's hydrated and a little bit. Um, more active in the water and able to be digested by beta glucanase, um, that that rate is happening at the same time. The solubilization and the digestion by beta glucanase, um, oh, which contributes to about a flat line of beta glucan concentration for thirty minutes during that first thirty minute raise. So, like every time there's a beta glucanase, I mean, I'm this is sort of a, a unfair simplification, but anytime there's a beta glucanase beta glucan molecule, it gets immediately chewed up by the a, by the beta glucanase um, as soon as it's made. Yeah, I, th I think I think that's that's a good approximation. Um, 
but we see then once the beta glucanase activity starts to uh, starts to disappear as that enzyme is denatured at higher temperatures we see an accumulation of more beta glucan in the wort um so now it's being solubilized but there's no more beta glucanase to to snatch it up and start snipping it into smaller pieces which makes to- that again this makes total sense this is exactly kind of what you expected to see um with the EBC mash, you expected to see some beta glucanase activity at the beginning, but then as the enzyme denatures, you start to see more beta glucans because there's not as much beta glucanase activity happening at higher temperatures. So I'm guessing then that probably means you saw what you expected to see in the IOB mashes as well. Yes. Um, so with the IOB mash, the beta glucanase activity um, decreases rapidly right from the beginning of the mash because that temperature is just too high for it to maintain its shape and maintain its activity. Um, and because there's no beta glucanase activity, beta glucan concentration can just go up and up and up and up. Um, and that effect is only exacerbated when there's more beta glucan in the grains Um uh, we we saw much higher levels of final wort beta glucan with these under modified condition barley's um, compared to anything that we saw in the EBC mashes. Right, and and even just IOB versus EBC, you saw some like much higher uh, beta glucan concentrations in the IOB mashes than in the EBC mashes. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. And then there's the whole malt modification piece of it too, which I want to get to um, in just a second. But I want to ask this question. This may be, again, this may also be a little bit unfair of a question because it may not be, there may not be an answer. Um, But like, how bad are we talking about um, in the uh, the IOB match? Like, how much worse was it, uh, you know, for the IOB versus the EBC? Yeah, it was, um, it it was uh, like, gosh, I, too, too tough. That was a tough question. Yeah. Um, well, because I know that I know that there's a number in the in the research, and I should have written written it down. Um, it's like a hundredfold greater, right? It, wow. It's completely yeah. completely another conversation. Um, how much more glucan there is in an under modified IOB mash compared to an under my modified EBC mash? Um, yeah. So, so I, I mean, that's a sort of a big takeaway, right? It is I mean, if you're experiencing stuck sparges or slow sparges, you might consider doing something more similar to the EBC mesh, right? Or a rest around 45 Celsius or 113 Fahrenheit, you know, so that you can encourage this uh, beta glucanase activity, maybe increase your runoff times uh, by letting it sit for, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes, something like that um, at that temperature. Right. I mean, this is kind of that's kind of a big takeaway from this. If you're having these issues um, with stuck sparges, this may be an option for brewers to consider. Yeah, absolutely. I think temperature is uh, a key factor in controlling the amount of beta glucan you end up in uh, you end up with in in your wort um, when the the barley and the malt uh aren't aren't quite at the same level of quality as typical. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there's been a lot of conversation about, you know, malt quality, um, you know, and how malt quality is decreasing. I don't know if that means that there's higher concentrations of beta glucans. Um, you know, that's not really inside, you know, something that you or I have in, in our purview, but I've heard comments about that. And so that makes this is kind of this is, again, this interesting research to think about, uh, you know, Improving maybe uh, uh, or or reducing haze, um, you know, could be an issue too. If you've got some of this unwanted haze, maybe you need to spend some time um, at a lower temperature uh, before just doing the one single infusion mash. You know, at sixty five Celsius, one hundred and fifty Fahrenheit, uh, or one hundred and fifty five Fahrenheit. Um, you know, that's pretty cool. And th- but then there's another piece of this too. The the it's the malt condition itself, like under modified versus well modified, uh, you know, and the Pilsner malt and the caramel malt. So talk to us about those results a little bit. Yeah. Um, so we saw that with uh, the addition of Pilsner and caramel malts, there was an increase in the amount of beta glucans contributed. Um, and so this is in part because the caramel malt tends to be a little less modified um, and the kilning process is different. So it's not contributing any beta glucanase. Um, however, these results um, weren't the most statistically significant. So um when compared with a, a, a test of difference, a, a t-test, um, 
there were some differences. However, um, it pales in comparison to the differences seen between the the under modified condition with the the ten and twenty percent barley compared to the all malt conditions. Um, and so I think that's a good sign. You know, brewers that are brewing with specialty malts likely already have um, have the right tools in their toolbox to to keep beta glucan concentrations under control. It's when we start talking about brewing with with barley or other unmalted grains is when um, beta glucan maybe makes more of a con- contribution. Yeah, unmalted grains or under malt or under modified malts, right? That so that's having a a big a uh, big impact as well. You see a lot more beta glucans in both mash regimes, right? Like if you're looking at like modification as a condition in either mash regime, either EBC or IOB, uh th- you're seeing higher beta glucan levels from under modified grains. Correct, yes. Yeah, that that's interesting too. So I you know, and I'm kind of thinking about this in terms of like okay, putting these together. It's like if you're doing the EBC mash with a well modified grain as most maltsters are doing, right? Whenever they're doing this for their malt quality analyses, they're not seeing a lot of beta or maybe they're seeing less beta glucan than a brewer might see if they're using the IOB method. And then if a brewer is using the IOB method with an under modified grain, you're going to see a lot of uh, uh, of beta glucan. Yeah, so there's there's lots of little con- uh, different conditions that can compound and multiply um, over over kind of that that flow chart of all the different <laughs> decisions you can make in your brewing process. Um, so I think yeah, temperature control is, is a tool that brewers have. Um, in this study, we haven't talked a lot about, but those exogenous enzymes are really handy um, and. Uh, with with climate change um, and other pressures uh, affecting the the global supply chain, um, sometimes you're not going to get the malt you want. And so, being able to think about temperature, think about uh, types of grains, think about exogenous enzymes are all good tools to have in the toolkit. Yeah, all of those things. And there was one other aspect of your study that caught me sort of by surprise too. And you you looked at wort viscosity um, as well as compared to beta glucans. Let's spend a couple of minutes on that before we wrap things up. Yeah. So with with beta glucan research, um, there's always been kind of a kind of a discussion of how impactful are the beta glucans compared to all of the other uh, molecules, proteins, starches in in beer and wort um so i wanted to measure viscosity as well as evaluate the um the filtration efficiency of of my mashes um the method i used to measure viscosity did not have a a strong relationship between beta glucan concentration and viscosity um and so part of that is that um, beta glucan isn't the main driver for, the, for viscosity in wort. A lot of it is um, sugar and dextrin concentration, um, which is not a, a factor that I measured in this study. Yeah, interesting. So th- that one, that one is again, I was it surprised me a little bit, but I think it's explainable, right? I was I because again, my th- my understanding of beta glucans is ah oh, sticky, sticky wort, right? And that's that's the relationship. Higher beta glucans means stuck sparge. Oh, you know. Um, but in this case, it wasn't really a viscosity issue, right? I mean, it wasn't like the the wort itself or that the liquid itself was too viscous. Um, you know, maybe those those um the grains are sticking together in other ways but like you said there are other uh other compounds in solution like dextrins and sugars and stuff that are in there that are also sticky as well yes yeah so i did i did observe some samples that had higher viscosity some samples that had lower but they were all well within the parameters for what we would consider typical for wort um, compared with other studies um one area that i did see um more obvious uh uh more obvious differences with the level of beta glucan was when I was evaluating my my mash filtration. Um, so the samples that had the under modified um, condition took a lot longer uh, to to filter. The under modified and IOB condition took a lot longer to filter than the other samples. Yeah. So something's going on, right? Something is happening. Those samples took longer to filter. So something is something is is uh, uh, having an impact there. It may not be beta glucans. It may be something else. But something is certainly uh, causing an issue with under modified malts and that uh, that uh, the IOB method with the high uh, starting temperature, the high 65 Celsius starting temperature. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
I think yeah, the these these ending um, tests on viscosity and filtration were were more of a way to check to see if there was an obvious pattern. Um, I think yeah, beta glucan might be a factor, um, but there's a lot else going on with the the wart matrix uh, that likely explains these these findings. Yeah, exactly. So so then some big summaries from this research, right? There's really cool stuff that came out of this. The 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 mash profile, the mash regime itself uh, plays a pretty big role, right? At least comparing the EBC method versus this modified IOB method that you used in this study. Um it's but like mash regime changing the temperature of the mash will change the beta glucan concentration. Yeah, temperature affects enzymes, affects the the fiber, the beta glucan, um, and this is what we expected to see, and and we saw it play out. Yeah, and then of course the the modification level of the grains under modified or brewing, like you said, with ingredients that have um, higher starting beta glucan levels. Uh, you know, like under modified malts or barley or you know oats or or things like that that have higher beta glucans. That is actually going to change the beta glucanase activity and the ultimate concentration of beta glucan that's in the wort regardless of the mash regime, right? It's just going to be, if you're using those sorts of ingredients, there's going to be higher beta-glucan concentration in the wort, at least according to this study. Yeah, yeah. You start with more, you end up with more, um, and that's compounded when you don't have any enzyme activity available. Yeah, like when you're using that higher mash. So it's pretty cool. Like, this is fun. I, I, I see that there's... It, it is interesting, too, because this is a lot of things. This is a scientific result showing a lot of anecdotal uh, uh, solutions that brewers have whenever they have these issues, right? When they have stuck sparges, they either they maybe do a, a, a protein rest or a lower temperature rest, or they uh, might increase, you know, the amount of water uh, in, in solution so that there's, you know, more more water um, and and, and uh, things don't, aren't as sticky. Or, uh, you know, again, they, they might use different grains. Uh, like a Pilsner malt or, or a two row instead of something that's under modified or oats or anything. This is really interesting to me. Uh, and, and I see why you did this study, right? It's like looking at what brewers are really doing whenever they're thinking about uh, beta glucanase. And we talked about a whole bunch of uh, uh, things in this episode about beta glucans. But if you want brewers to take away just one thing from today's episode, what would that be? Yeah, I think um, something that we haven't touched on too much yet is that um, the the beta glucan seems to only have, and this is from a little bit of my study, but also papers that I've read um, from others, that beta glucan starts affecting uh, your your filtration and uh, wort viscosity when it's above about 200 milligrams per liter. So that's why we saw some effects with um, the IOB mash with under modified conditions because those had a higher high enough level of beta-glucan concentration to start impacting the wort. But I think there's there's a lot of room to just kind of let beta-glucan sort itself out for most brewers in most conditions. Um, the study is an interesting way of, of seeing what's going on behind the scenes and observing that. Um, but I think you know, everyone can take a deep breath. And <laughs> uh, this, this doesn't seem like everyone's uh, daily stress of... Uh, what to do about beta glucans. Um, but I think it is interesting to to think about um, there are conditions where it could make an impact um, and it's something to not lose complete sight of. Right, right. I, I love that. There are conditions where this could be an issue, right? There, there. If you're seeing these sort of issues with your brewing, uh, then look at beta glucans and see if that's something that will help you um, in your brewing practices. Well, awesome, Sophie. Well, um, is there anything else that you wanted to share about that we didn't get to today? Yeah, um, I think uh, so. The there's some things that weren't able to make this paper. Um, I also looked at uh, there's thermostable alleles for beta glucanase from wild barley. Um, so I did look at the potential for that to be more active in the IOB style mash. Um, I don't I don't think I have quite enough results uh, to to publish that data. But um, there are thermostable enzymes that exist, which are intriguing um, uh, and perhaps something for someone else to look at <laughs> at a future date. Um, so that enzyme substrate relationship, it's so dependent on temperature and 
besides modifying the temperature of the mash, we could modify the temperature that the enzyme is is comfortable at. Oh, yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah. Like it, it, temperature. I mean, this study showed that very well. Right. The EBC versus the IOB mash temperature had a big role um, on enzyme activity here. Um, and that enzyme substrate substrate relationship can also uh, be very dependent on temperature. Well, very cool. All right. Well, um, Sophie, thank you so much for uh, talking about this research and joining me in the brew lab. Thanks, Cade. I had a fun time. All right. Well, listeners, in the show notes, you'll find a link to Sophie's paper, which is titled Simultaneous Evaluation of Beta-Glucan and Beta-Glucanase Relationship During Different Mash Temperature Profiles, published in the Journal of the American Society of Brewing Chemists in January of 2023. Be sure to check out next week's episode where Jordan and I will be breaking down the science and discussing how you can apply this research in your brewing. The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit Brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit Patreon.com slash Brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer.